The gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 15, verse 21 through 30, um, 28. It's an encounter with a, a Canaanite woman. It's, a, it's one of my favorite stories. Um, the Canaanite woman, a Gentile. So Jesus is already engaged in his ministry. He fed the 5,000. He walked on water. He had his solitude of prayer, as we witnessed last week. And as he's engaged in um, uh, dialogue with people who he's teaching now, uh, he's on the move. He is on the move. He's at the... He's sort of the, in the middle of his uh, journey in his ministry. And as he is engaged with people, and as he converses with people, he's also growing and learning, and he encounters this woman. And so a remarkable story that I hope that the grace and love of God may be shared through this story in your life and in our world today. And all God's people said, amen. Here it goes. And Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon, and just then, a Canaanite woman from the region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord. Have mercy on me, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, oh, Send that woman away, for she keeps shouting after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Here ends the scripture reading. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God. Thanks be to God. Um, before I delve into this text and share with you the good news embedded in these texts, I want to have a little excursion conversation about dogs for a second. A woman called a local minister looking for a Presbyterian pastor. And the minister answered the phone and she said at the other end, my dog just died and I need to find a Presbyterian minister to officiate this funeral for my dog. And the pastor, having answered this phone call, was a little bit annoyed. Usually he does funeral memorial service for human beings but for a dog request. It was very unusual. So he suggested, um, perhaps there are, there are other ministers in the neighborhood you might uh, be able to get in touch with, and maybe he or she will officiate your dog's funeral. And she said, okay, um, I will call and see if other um, pastors in the neighborhood might, who might be able to officiate a funeral for my dog. But I have to ask you of an advice before I do so. Uh, do you think it's an appropriate um, to give a thousand dollar honorarium to the pastor or to the church to write a check? And uh, the, the Presbyterian minister in response quickly said, why didn't you tell me your dog was a Presbyterian? <laughs> now, that's on the more lighter side of the dog story. On a more serious note, I think there is an assumption about dogs and pets, how we treat our pets, right? We all, how many of you have dogs at home? Raise your hand. Okay. All right. Now, have you ever been to a third world or a developing country, how some of these dogs are running around, right? Right? Um, and no one seems to own the dog, but they just like roam around. You don't see any... Um, somebody getting their dog food out and putting in the, the dog, whatever. But they just roam around the street, just fend for themselves, and they play with the kids. And uh, they're, no one claims them, and they're just ignored at the same time, right? And so the dogs were not treated like the way we understand dogs as our own personal pet at home. The dogs in the ancient Near East, 
didn't have dog food you buy at a supermarket. Didn't have that, okay? The dogs that I know as a child when I was growing up in Korea back in the 70s when it was, you know, people were living on a dollar a day at the time. Now it's different, of course. They do have pets and they do take care of them. There is a, 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 um, you know, pet hospitals and uh, hotels, right, while you're away on vacation. But none of that existed during the time of Jesus. Now, the only other reference that I could think of in the New Testament in regard to dogs um, is the story of Lazarus. Do you know the story of the rich man who begged Abraham to, uh, you know, tell his family members about what's life after? And, and, he, and, he, and he was reminded of the beggar that was begging at the door of his door, uh, house, how the sore was so bad, Lazarus' sore was so bad, the dog came and licked the sore. Remember that? And that's the kind of imagery that we have, okay, of dogs. So the dog's a friendly dog that's, you know, waiting at the table for the food to drop from your table that you eat. That kind of image is sort of... Um, It fades away in the reality of dog's world back in the ancient Near East. So, let's listen to the story one more time with the understanding that dogs were like that during the time and treated like that, okay? Jesus is on his way on his journey and a Canaanite woman started to scream, Son of David, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. My daughter is ill. You've been touching all these lives and been giving, you're you're dispensing your healing power and been touching people's lives and have recovered. Touch my daughter. Touch my daughter. Share some of that gift that you have. Share some of that one power that Penny sang this morning. Share that one power, son of David, have mercy, have mercy. My daughter, my daughter, my daughter, she cries out. Now the disciples were annoyed by this. Now, I understand these disciples, they were in these towns that served for his own people, you know, their own kind. And this woman out of nowhere, this stranger, a Canaanite woman, a local rivalry, right? Son of David, they were annoyed. Can you tell that woman to just go away? It's really bothering us. It's distraction for us as we are engaged in our ministry. She's a distraction while we are dispensing our grace to the people that we love. Jesus said nothing. She was silent. Again, this time she said, I'm not getting any attention here. So she runs this time and stands in front of Jesus and is on her knees this time, as the scripture says. She falls on her knees, stops him on his track, and says, Son of David, Have mercy on me. Hear my cry. Can you sense the desperation of this woman? Can you feel it? What if it was your own daughter? And you knew that this was an opportunity that you cannot afford to lose. There's no hospitals. This is it. She heard rumors and she saw what Jesus could do. You saw what he could do. And this was an opportunity of a lifetime. And your daughter is sick. What do you do? She came and kneeled before him. Have mercy on me. And instead, Jesus being compassionate as we have seen in the previous chapter, with thousands of people who were there gathered in the Galilee having compassion over them and feeding them with two fish and five loaves of bread, with the miraculous event of feeding all and having 12 baskets left over. What happened to the 12 baskets? Bring some of those goods here and give it to her. Right? Instead, he says, what did he say? I came that I may serve my people only. Right? I came for my lost sheep. I don't know about you. I don't have time for this. My time is limited. I'm on schedule. Right? Do you resonate with that? I'm on schedule. You are a distraction. Now some of you here say, hey, hey, wait a minute, Pastor Day. Wait a second. Are you saying that Jesus was being offensive? 
that can't be because, you know, Jesus is perfect. Jesus is God incarnate. Now, if you hold the belief that when Jesus was conceived and was born in the manger, just a day old, with all the divine perfection, omnipotent, omniscient, and what have you, with all the, the absolute qualities of God in Christ, then there's no room for growth, right, as a human being. Right? If you hold that to be true, which a lot of traditional interpretations have said, well, then if that's the case, you see, Jesus knew all along what's going on here, so Jesus was actually testing this woman's faith. That's an awful way of testing somebody's faith. On the other hand, if you hold the view that Jesus, fully human, also understood and was evolving and growing, and beginning to understand that the very mission that he had was even bigger than he thought he had possessed. And that he was also a human being who felt the pains of the other and also was resistant to pain like we are, and afraid of pain and suffering. So he knew before in, Gethsem uh, in Gethsemane, in Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Lord, if possible, take this pain, this suffering away from me, but not my will. And he struggled so much, the sweat that came down, his brow was like blood, he says, right? If you take Jesus to be like us, resonate with our suffering and our joy and the love that we experience as someone who is evolving and growing, it makes total sense to me for him to say, as we have often slipped and said, I came only for my people. Who are you again? I came here to feed my people. I don't have enough for you all. The same logic that we apply in the way in which we discriminate people, right? We got a limited resource. We don't have enough for you. Sorry. Sorry. But on top of that, what else did he say? What does the scripture say? Now, this is real offensive. Listen. What does he say? But Lord, before she, she says that, help me. I beg you. She continues to persevere and beg, and he turns to her and says, it is not right. It is not right to take the children's food and throw it, not even giving. The word give is not even there. This as a gift or generosity. And throw it to the what? Dogs. What is he implying in that sentence? You're, a, you're not my children. You are. Now, how many of you, if you were her, you were on your knees, and Jesus says to you, I came for my children only, for the lost sheep, and it is not right for me to throw the food to the dogs. Okay, I will make an immediate shift from the desperation and the need for my daughter's healing to rising with anger. I'll be so offended. I will be, oh, you, did, you, did I just hear it correctly? You called me a dog? <laughs> wow. Actually, in the Korean transliteration, I won't say it here because uh, we get 600 hits in videotapes, right? <laughs> <laughs> Internet. But it's a pretty bad word to say that. Okay. The worst word you could say it. But instead, you have to wonder, what is it about this woman that in spite of this kind of obstacles, huh? in spite of this impediments or, or wall, clearly, the healer that he, she sought after for healing denied her. But what was it about her and what was it that she saw in him or saw that he, was, he possessed, that she was able to be persistent? And without losing a beat, she responds by saying, I love this. What did she say? Even the dogs eat from the 
bread that the crumbs, the crumbs that falls from the table, master's table, even the dogs. Mm -mm. You're not going to be denying me this. No. You're not denying me this. You're not denying me this. Even the dogs will eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. What you possess, the vision of ministry that you possess, is larger than you. It's larger than you. And I want to help you embody that. <laughs> Jesus had an awakening moment, an epiphany. Now, for most of us, now this is what I love about Jesus, in spite of his imperfections as a human being in that nature. Now, most of us, if we were corrected, right, and we had to make a, a shift in our worldview of things, whether it's our faith, whether it's about how we see things in our world, what is our immediate response usually? No. No, I'm right. Right? Don't tell me otherwise. I know what I said is to be true. Are you telling me otherwise that my truth is not the right one, but that I should attain a higher truth of what you believe to be true? No. Immediately we will deny it, right? We're not receptive to growth unless pain is involved, right? Unless we find ourselves at the bottom somewhere where we tried hard and we've gone to the edge of our belief and edge of our understanding and when we have come to that wall and you say, you know what, maybe she was right, <laughs> right? And you have second thoughts and reflection. But for Jesus, there's an immediate connection. She understood, he understood. What did he say? Oh, you're right. Aha. Great is your faith. This is the only time you will find in the scripture. Often he will say to his disciples, you of little faith. But here, of all the people that he'd engaged up to this point in his, his ministry, his narrow tunnel vision that catered only to his lost sheep has exploded to encompass the universal need of all human beings. You're right. Great is your faith. Go. Your daughter is healed. And people of God said, Amen. Wow. Wow. The realization that it's not a battle between the lost sheep Israelite or the Canaanite or Palestinians who are actually the descendants of that. Well, it's a little bit more complicated, but I won't go there right now. And then you have these different groups of people in our world that says, hey, it's for my folks here. We see that everywhere, fundamentally, right? Isn't this the cause of violence with each other? Look what's going on in Ukraine, right? My people. Oh, my people happen to be there, so it must be ours. <laughs> right? My people. Secure my people at the expense of others. Right? The fundamentalist group, what is that? Extremist state, right? They're trying to, like, one-third of the Iraq is now taken over by this group because they're saying, my way or the highway. The whole extremist Islamic vision is to have the whole world under, under its religious fundamentalism, right? So, there are all these kinds of stuff going on. What's going on in Ferguson, too? Any isms, whether it's race, sex, ism, nationalism, nationalism, whatever ism, it's all about fundamentally a power struggle, right? And that says, my power over against yours so that you may imitate my assumptions and my absolute worldview because I'm privileged and I'm gonna maintain that privilege. Going back to Ferguson for a second, I was reading a newspaper, uh, I think it was Pastor Renita, I believe. She was sh shot with a rubber, rubber bullet. Did you hear about that? She was marching, uh, protesting, negotiating between the police officers who were uh, heavily militarized, 
right? I was like, where, where is this going? Is this back in the 1960s imagery? And she was shot with a, a, a rubber bullet because she was saying to the people, you know, let's do a peaceful march, and the police was there, and she happened to be right in, the, in between the, you know, the marchers and, and, um, and the, pro, uh, the police officers who were guarding the streets. And all of a sudden, <laughs> a fire went off, and if it was a real bullet, it would have killed her, but it, it hit her stomach, and there's this really terrible looking wound. And I think she's taking that scar as a pride <laughs> right now. Okay? And she said something very interesting this morning when I was reading, and she said, you know, our battle is not against the police department here. Our battle is against the system and cultures and how we see each other, how that creates a situation where something like Michael Brown could be shot and killed. That's an excessive force. Now, on the one hand, yes, the criminal investigation needs to go on and the truth must be told. But a larger question beneath all this you know, rioting going on and people are going, oh my God, people are so angry. What's going on? So emotionally charged. As if this is so surprising. When for people who have been oppressed and people have been living under a system of racism, it's a different story. So, we need to hear. We need to listen. The desperation. It's a universal desperation, this Canaanite woman. The cry of mothers. It's a universal desperation that we all long as a human being. And that cut right through all the BSs around it. And Jesus was able to actually hear this woman. The crumbs. The crumbs. The crumbs. Have you ever felt that desperation? Have you ever felt that need to be touched and to be healed? The good news. Now, I could go on and preach for another hour. I heard the church that is growing. People, pastors tend to preach a little longer. <laughs> no amen here on that one, right? Okay, all right. Now let me get to the gospel, the good news. What is then the good news in this story? Now some of you might say, hey, Dave's going politicizing this whole thing. No, that's not about politicizing. It's about the gospel of truth, the good news of God's universal love in response to a universal need. Our battle as a faith community is not just simply to be feel good about ourselves here in the worship space, feel empowered, all empowerment to you, like, one power. But that one power, as a matter of fact, that you possess this day as you journey on your faith. You may think, like Jesus, that you were here for the lost sheep, for our congregation, for our Presbyterian church. But what you possess, the vision that's been given to you, the faith that has been entrusted to you and me. Listen to the Canaanite woman. It's larger than you think. It's bigger than what we assume or we possess as our faith. Do you not, do you, I not want to hear our Jesus who says to us one day when we challenge and recognize and respond to the universal need for peace and reconciliation in our world, in our home, and beyond, and say, great is your faith? Hmm? So, the cry of that desperation of that woman cuts through the narrow horizon and vision and enables Jesus to see beyond. It is that cry that we need to hear today, knowing that that one power that was sang by Penny, the love of God is universal and is beyond our own four corners of the wall. Our battles, it's not just simply my personal struggle to overcome whatever that you are maybe facing in life, but you are to live your life beyond your own experience, your own community, and your own family. But that's the challenge, right? That's the reason why we are here as a faith community. That cry will be here. Whether it is in Baghdad, whether it is a, a woman crying in Yadizi in the mountains struggling right now, 
whole family dying, running away from the Islamic extremists, whether it is that Palestinian woman crying out for the loss of her daughter, okay, or anywhere else in the world, we begin to recognize that what we have been entrusted, the faith and the vision that we have, is larger than what we possess. May each and every one of us be challenged today and see that the crumbs from the master's table is everywhere. And while the world and power that be are feasting on their tables, there are crumbs out there, and there are people who are struggling for those crumbs. May those cries be heard in our hearts. And you don't have to go halfway around the world to know that. It's right at our doorstep. May the blessings of God, peace of Christ, be with each and every one of us this day. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your love. We trust that there's no one beyond the reach of your love. We profess it and we confess it, we sing it, we praise it, yet we look at our own lives, we're so consumed and, and by our own self that we are unable to see beyond ourself. We feel as though if you focus just on myself, I will find happiness. If I just have so much more, if I just have enough of this or that, then I could be happy without recognizing the truth that if we serve when we engage in a world of universal need that we find ourselves when we lose ourselves in the need of others that we find ourselves you have called us you have enabled us you have given us more than enough to make a difference in our world in our community and in our home so help us O oh God to be empowered by listening to the voices of needs in our world and respond to that need with our call we thank you for the summer we thank you for the fellowship and our faith community we thank you for the Canaanite woman. We thank you for those eruptions in our community, in our society, that cries out for justice. In Jesus' name we pray.